All right, hello everybody and welcome. My name is Jovanina. I use she, her pronouns and uh, myself and Woody are the co-directors for Washington, Maine, Northwest Aquatic and Marine Educators. And we are an organization, what we like to come call a family of educators from Oregon, Washington, British Columbia and Alaska. And our primary event of the year is a large conference that we put on every summer, which is actually how Woody met Mindy, was at the conference this summer. So we're so happy to have her here with us tonight. Um, and then we also do chapter events. We actually just had a chapter, a Washington chapter event yesterday, which was a sail aboard the Adventuress. Um, we do low tide beach walks sometimes. We've done sleepovers at the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium. Um, we've done clamming events, lots of fun chapter events that we try to get the educators together um, so we can share stories, hang out, and um, learn from each other. So um, thank you for joining us tonight. The speaker series we started during COVID um, and we've kind of just continued it because it has been a fun thing to do. It's added to our membership and um, hopefully you will enjoy our speaker this evening. Um, and so we'll be doing uh, one of these for the first Monday of the month at 6.30 p.m. We post them on, on the website and our Facebook page. And now y'all are on the, uh, the mailing list. So you'll we'll find out about that as well. We're still working. I think we actually have the November speaker line lined up. And we're going to do a speak a speaker who's going to speak to uh, King Tides mm -hmm. in Washington and Oregon. Yeah, so that should be that should be great. All right. Um, okay, so I'm sorry, I thought that um, Carol said that her person could after or Kathy said that her person could afterwards. So our King Tides thing was then going to be in December. That's my understanding as well. But yeah. I it was it, it was just quite a an email chain, but I'm pretty sure, Fawn, I my understanding was the same as you, that yeah. Kathy said that the BC person could do November after all, and we were pushing King Tides to, to December. December. Okay. Good. All right, good. I'm sorry. I didn't, <laughs> Yay! I didn't see that last it's a, That's good. Okay. It's well, a high class know. problem to have too many people yeah. who want yeah. to present in this format. So okay. Yeah. okay, well, we will um I will look for those emails to confirm and then we'll send out all the information to get up on the web page so we can clarify. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. We're gonna do a, um, an acknowledgement next and then we'll move into our speaker for this evening. So we would like to acknowledge the people whose land we are gathered on today. Presently, Woody and I live in West Seattle um, which is the traditional village sites of the Duwamish and the Coast Salish people. These tribes made their homes on these lands and along these waters. Let us also acknowledge the robust indigenous communities made up of tribal diversity that originate from around the country and whose journeys have brought them here and to other locations by way of forced displacement or seeking community opportunities. Today, the same communities celebrate their heritage, showing resilience and tenancy that would be greatly admired by their ancestors. Further, we respectfully, respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people, primarily of African descent, who provided exploited labor on which this country was built with little to no recognition. Today, we are indebted to that labor and the labor of many black and brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows for our collective benefit. Okay. Um, now I want to introduce uh, Dr. Mindy Chapel. Um, I met Mindy down at the um, the Name Conference in Neatarts this past summer. And um, for name folk, what we're, we're with a speaker series, each chapter is taking a turn finding a speaker. And so this is Washington's turn. And I stole an <laughs> Oregon speaker. Sorry. 
it was I was like she's too good we're not <laughs> location is irrelevant we're so so very excited we're starting this series very excited to to have you uh Mindy um Mindy is a native of East St Louis Illinois and currently resides in Oregon uh, where she serves as an assistant professor at Portland State University she obtained her PhD in science education from the University of Illinois Chicago. She was a former Chicago public school science teacher and alumni Ella Baker trainer with the Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools program. Mindy's committed to fostering curricular and pedagogical practices that support youth's development as change agents who use the knowledge and skills acquired in their science classes to advocate for their community and transform their world. Her primary research explores the affordance of ethno dance an arts based embodied representation of one's narrative as a tool to study black students science identity construction and authoring. She attributes her professional and personal accomplishments to having supportive caring and inspiring lanterns throughout her life, I love that term Mindy takes this as an informal and sharing space. Uh, she. We talked earlier and, and I really love her philosophy, which is that she's learned a lot of this through her own personal experience. Um, and she understands the importance of taking what she's learned and then going back and giving it, uh, sharing it with educators, the rest of us who are also doing the work as well. Um, so with that, I, I'm going to just turn it over to Mindy. Thank you so much, Mindy, for being here. Oh, let me quickly, sorry, real quick say, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. And um, we may, if it's relevant to what Minnie's talking about, uh, we'll, we'll bring it up at the moment, but we might have to get to it uh, later at the end of the presentation. Sorry about that, Minnie. <laughs> no, no apology needed. Thank you for that beautiful and warm introduction. And thank you to Name Washington, um, name for having me. It's an honor to be here and I am elated to be able to share with you my experiences along the way learning to engage in real life issues of environmental justice in my science classroom. We already had a land acknowledgement and so um, I will say thank you for that and I say. So then why are we here? What's the focus? My hope is that you will learn from me how I leveraged the chemistry curriculum in collaboration with the Youth with History Science Collective. And I'll talk about that more in depth, but what I learned was to find the people who were doing the work and work with them and allow them to be your support and allow them to be who you lean on, you know, in point in times of frustration or in times of, you know, joy and celebration. And so that will be the focus of this talk, like learning learning from me how I learned how to do that. This talk is meant to be an avenue of hope for educators who want to leverage their agency and curricular resources to teach people or to teach science from a social justice science issue perspective or a justice center science pedagogy. And what that means is um, I'm not one to try to tell people how they should teach. I am one to use my steps to try to make the path of those who want to teach science from a justice center pedagogy a little easier and help them find entry points when it might be challenging to do so alone. And so I always say those who came before us should have learned some things along the way to make the steps of those coming at us a little lighter. And so that is the focus or the goal of this talk. So my journey, how did I get to where I'm at now? So when I think about my journey along the way and shifting how I position science, and I say how I position science because I acknowledge that as a practitioner of science, whether I want to or not, I become a vessel for passing down scientific knowledge, which then if I don't acknowledge how science is constructed, then I just pass down westernized knowledge without realizing or problematizing that. And so I started off wanting students to love or to like science. And so, you know, I would say things like science is great, you should be a scientist. Um, and then as I started to engage with science more, then I started to say, you know what, I don't really 
want my students to just love or like science. I want my students to know that they're capable of doing science. I want them to know that regardless of what other people say or who they are and how they position them, that they're just as capable as anyone else and they deserve a seat at the table. So that's when I started saying things like science is useful. You can do science regardless if you're like it or not. And so then that led to me developing what I called activity to inquiry projects in my classroom. So this was my first attempt to having students engage more intimately with science where they were um, developing the experiments. And so there were activities that I started out as just demos and things like that. And then they led to explorations for students. It wasn't until I was in the doctorate program where I was in a group of what we call in Freedom School, like-minded people and souls, where I was just around teachers who all wanted to teach science and they wanted to be able to teach science in a way that helped young people learn to appreciate and critique science as practitioners of science, holding science accountable for the harms that science has done and also appreciating what science could help us understand about the world around us, but also how science could help us transform our world around us beyond like innovation or beyond like maintaining our place in the global market. So then the first entry for that was the Flint case study. And so I led students through different activities, and I'll talk about those in detail a little bit more, but different activities where they explore what was really happening in Flint and how did the situation get to be as grave as it was. Um, and from there, we started to do what we call lead talk activities where students would share their information in a very informal situation, like after school with the community, what they were learning about lead as we were going through the process. And where I'm kind of at now is wanting students to be able to critique and appreciate science. And that wanting to be able to critique, critique and appreciate science, meaning I became a part of a network, a collabor a connection of teachers. So we call ourselves the Youth, the Youth Participatory Science Collective um, because we are a group of teachers outside of Chicago who met one summer in um, someone's living room. And we were all just trying to figure out how could we use science to help understand what was happening in our communities around heavy metal contamination. So we weren't trying to figure out whether or not it was worth it. We were already committed to doing that type of work we just met to figure out what standards did we need to focus on, what content was important, and things of that nature. And that led to the YPS project that I did in my classroom for the last five years. So when I say activity to inquiry was my entry point to shifting how I position sign in my classroom, what do I mean? There is an activity where I always did these make it take it activities at the end of the school year because I wanted students to have something to remember their experience in science that year. And so um, I was teaching chemistry at the time and one of the make it take it activities was I show young people how to make hand sanitizer. And I bought these cute little bottles with the little rings and things like that. And they got to take them with them. And so just in conversation with students, one of my AP students was saying, oh, you know, people are overusing hand sanitizer and they were asking questions about the different concentration and what that meant. And so I just kind of turned it back to students and I was like, I don't know, what do you think it meant? Why do you think, you know, 60% versus 70% or 90%? How do you think that would, you know, impact the effectiveness of the alcohol? And so it led to a cross-disciplinary uh, student-led investigation between chemistry and biology where students took this activity and they developed a um, investigation where they developed the teacher documents and the student's document. They made different varying concentrations of alcohol. I didn't even know um, it was another teacher who verified the concentrations just because they wanted me to kind of go through the experiment um, and test their procedure and things like that. And so just seeing students flourish with the autonomy to kind of like develop their own experiments and really seeing them connect with like biology to go get the incubators and like the agar trays and all of those type of things. Um, for me, it was kind of like a aha moment as a teacher where it's like, hmm, 
when you use your platform to create space for young people to show you their brilliance and to engage and try things in science, my goodness, um, what they will show you. And so this was kind of like my first attempt at shifting how I position science, moving away from just prescriptive class, I'm sorry, moving away from prescriptive labs where I gave them the lab, it was already developed and I always have this you know, like predicted outcome of what the lab would look like. I shifted to inquiry to action where it was an activity, but students could manipulate the different variables to test different things. And it was all student led and student focused. A couple of years later, I was teaching a biology class for just one year and um, students were having these like anecdotal conversations about bottled water versus tap water. And they were really arguing about whether or not bottled water was better and safer for us versus municipal water, tap water. And so we were engaging in this case study um, from the national database of case studies about bottled water versus tap water. And literally this was a week before the Flint crisis made national news. And who I am as a person, my soul could not rest with us literally talking about water and then this crisis um, that was uh, impacting people that was relatively close to us um, being in Chicago I could not rest without addressing that while I was you know already talking about water so I completely flipped <laughs> completely flipped my curriculum and so instead of us just studying water and talking about water and figuring out whether or not bottled water versus tap water um you know which one was the best and safe for us I literally remember putting on like my chucks and everything for like two weeks straight and um I allowed students to design experiments where they tested multiple things related to the Flint crisis I just told them we have to be able to do it within a time and a space that we have with the materials that we have and with the resources available to us. Meaning that if there, if I can't get it from somewhere for us, then that's an experiment we won't be able to test. And so what that, what that looked like at the end, students are tech, tested things like the effectiveness of boil orders on contaminated water. As a science person, I could have told them, yes, if you boil water with lead, then it's actually going to increase the concentration of lead because you're, you know, decreasing the ratio of solvent to solid, boom. It might've seemed very simple, but allowing young people to go through that process and find that out for themselves, you know, um, was just a pivotal point to their learning and their growth and really understanding the principles of science. Some of them tested like the effectiveness of different types of home filters. So they bought filters from the, we bought filters from the grocery store that said that they could filter different things. We also um, made homemade, filters using like zeolite and to see how that would work in filtering um, different concentrations of lead solutions. And then some groups also tested the pool and the drinking fountains at our school because around the time that the Flint crisis made national news in Chicago, like there was also a report about lead and water fountains at schools and also in um, like park drinking um, fountains and things like that. So students became interested in testing the the lead, the in testing our water for lead, specifically looking at the pool because many of them had to take swimming and they really didn't want to. So for them, testing the pool was less about, you know, we really think this water is contaminated, and more about we hope this water might be contaminated so that we won't have to get in the pool. Now, as their teacher, I could have very well said, absolutely not, we're not going to do that. But it was no harm for us in testing that water. Um, thankfully, you know, the, the results came back that there were no lead levels. There were um, low lead levels in the pool. Um, however, there was some lead in the drinking fountains. And so this was kind of like really moving away from how I position science as science is good. You know, you should be a scientist and, you know, Everything about science is great because, of course, I'm a practitioner of science. So for whatever reason, I love science. I engage in science. I've been doing science all these years. Um, and so the summer after I engaged in this Flint case study experimental design with my students is when I had the opportunity to meet with educators who later became the YPS Collective. And this really transformed how I position science and the purpose of science in my classroom. And so a little bit about YPS, the Y in YPS stands for youth. And YPS recognizes the unique contributions youth makes to the 
intergenerational struggles for social justice. It doesn't romanticize the contributions, but whether it challenges adultism and the, and the criminalization of youth and youth of color. So in other words, the Y and YPS positioned youth as co-investigators with us. They're doing the work alongside of us work versus just looking at the data later. And so when we think about participatory, the P and YPS emphasizes the participation of youth in all aspects of the knowledge production. It pushes citizen science by engaging youth, not just as samplers or data collectors, but also in development of localized questions, analysis of data, dissemination of results, and development of appropriate responses. And so what that looked like is doing the project, you know, students was helping determine where are we going to sample? Um, what will our sample size look like? How do we work to prevent contamination from this sample to that sample? How do we use technology to help us track and locate where the samples came from? When are we gonna collect the samples? Then who's gonna analyze them? Who's gonna be responsible for checking things like that? What knowledge and information do we need in order to be able to interpret this data? So that's what participatory look like. And then the science, the S and YPS acknowledges the unique insights and limitations associated with scientific ways of thinking. Engaging in YPS requires acknowledging that the discipline we teach have been shaped by and in turn have undergirded various forms of oppression like white supremacy, settler colonialism, and patriarchy. And what that means is as a practitioner of science, I cannot walk into a science classroom and pretend that science is objective and that science hasn't both been used for innovation as well as harm. I have to acknowledge that science has also caused some harms, attentional harms, because sometimes it get positioned in the name of science and we didn't know it was gonna be harmful, but that's not true. But specifically when we're talking about lead and the decision to add tetraethyl lead as a derivative to gasoline, you know, um, Thomas Megley was warned about the, the dangers and the hazards of it, but still made that decision. And so um, when we think about the science, for us in YPS, it's about acknowledging that for science and then figuring out how we can use science in a way to help us understand what's happening around us and also advocate for our communities. And so just a little bit about what a YPS project looks like, you know, so you're defining the social justice science issue, which in my case was looking at heavy metal soil contamination, specifically in Chicago and Humboldt Park you know, applying a scientific lens, what scientific knowledge is going to be helpful for me to be able to engage my students in this learning process. And then investigation for us that was collecting of soil samples, how do we plan and carry out that investigation, as well as then how do we analyze that data? How do we make sense of it? What instrumentations do we use? But then how do we reflect about what we learned about this information and then disseminate it, not necessarily just to academia, but also to our community? What's our responsibility for sharing the information without creating um, despair, but without over-exaggerating hope? So my first YPS project was in 2018, 2019 school year. And so I tried to embed studying heavy metal, heavy metal contamination specifically related to the soil in Chicago in one unit. This unit at the time was a 12 week unit. And it's the unit that we call the journey from the atom to the periodic table. So this is the unit that had like atomic structure, periodic table, periodic trends, all of that was in this unit. Um, and so some of the successes, we were able to collect the soil, we were able to take the soil to Northwestern University. So you'll see some pictures of my students actually at Northwest University in their chemist, their undergraduate chemistry lab, and they're doing the acid digestion of our soil samples so that they can later be um, analyzed by, by the um, EOS machines. And so we were able to do that. And then they later presented their results at a youth symposium at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Some of the constraints or challenges was trying to fit everything in one unit. It just felt very overwhelming. And it felt like I was always like going and going and going and trying to make sure that we were staying to this very strict and rigid timeline because I had to, you know, also get to the other chemistry content that wasn't specifically related to the YPS project. And unit three fell in the winter. 
And so when it fallen in the winter, if you can imagine in Chicago, the soil is pretty solid. So we couldn't do our soil sampling until about February, sometimes March, April, which meant, which meant we had a huge gap between when the actual learning of the content happened and when we were able to apply the scientific information in terms of planning and carrying out the investigation. So then I shifted. So what the project looked like over the next couple of years. So in 2019, 2020, I expanded the project across the school year. So instead of trying to force the project into one unit, I let the content still lie in unit three, which because that's where the main content knowledge was, but I also added a component where um, students were engaging in just little bits every, every month. So we would have Fridays where we would come back and say, okay, what is the next thing we need to do for our YPS project? What do we need to do to be ready for, you know, whether it was soil collecting, data analysis, presentations, and things like that. However, this year, that year we collected the soil samples from the school in the neighborhood, but we weren't able to analyze our samples because this is when um, you know COVID happened. And so we were no longer in the classrooms. And so we had our soil samples, but we weren't able to analyze them. And so at the same time, students from previous years became lab aides because another challenge that I was facing is trying to figure out how to make it a continuous project and not just something where it's like, okay, new group of students, I'm doing the same thing over again. You know, it just becoming very redundant and losing the, the primary focus of why I was doing the project in the first place. And so bringing students in from the previous years at Lab A's, not only was that support for me as the teacher to not feel like I had such a heavy lift, but it also positioned them as co-facilitators in the project and sharing and disseminating the information. And so in 2020, 2021, we were completely virtual. And so that shifted our project to a virtual platform, which worked out because then we were able to, as a collective, analyze the data from previous years that we, we had the data, but we, we hadn't made sense of what the data meant, looking at the parts per million and what does that mean in terms of remediation and um, how do we disseminate that information? Who do we need to contact and things of that sort? What sites do we need to retest? So we were virtual, we weren't able to go out and collect more samples, but we were still able to analyze data from previous years, um, especially looking at this as a continuous project. So these are where the students in 2020 left off. This is where we pick up in 2020, 2021. And then what are we gonna pass on to the next group? So the students um, in 2021, they wrote a comic to the future students outlining the future of the YPS project, what they, what they hoped um, the next group of students will do and um, what they had previously done. So in 2021, 2022, not necessarily comparing the years because I enjoyed the experience, but I think for me, it probably was the most exciting year um, of the YPS project. So if you can think I've been doing that work at that point for about five, six years, and it took that long for me to get to a YPS project that I felt like encompassed everything that I envisioned. So we were able to analyze the data from previous school years, across all YPS schools. So within the YPS collective, there are about eight or nine educators across different schools in Chicago, across different um, neighborhoods. And so we have all been collecting soil samples and in some, in some cases, air and water samples. And so we were able to compile this huge database of um, sample testing. And so, my students were able to look at that database and make sense of those numbers across all schools, but we focused mainly on lead and mercury. This school year, we were able to collaborate with culinary where the culinary students, um, they helped us develop, okay, what type of food do you need to eat if you're living in an area where you are possibly exposed to heavy metals? Because your body actually prefers the nutrients like calcium and potassium and things like that. So if they're available, you know, your receptors will uptake them versus the heavy metal. So then what type of food do we need to eat? And how do we prepare that food in a way that is going to be, you know, valuable for people? So should, should the spinach be sauteed versus should we eat the spinach raw if we're thinking about heavy metal contamination? And then how do we create space 
for our community to be able to um, partake in these vegetables. And so that looked like a community garden at our school connected with our um, Black Student Union, as well as our Student Voice Committee, who had a love fridge. And so the things that were you know, grown in the community garden could be put in the love fridge so that there can be community access. Now, that part didn't completely come to fruition this year because of you know just overlapping challenges with getting the our existing garden um, re-cultivated and then connecting with after school matters to be able to, you know, um, pay students to manage that. The garden exists and the love fridge exists. It just didn't happen before the end of the school year, but that's in progress now, even though I'm no longer there. Also partnering with the environmental geology, they're the ones who did the, um, the revitalization, revitalization of the garden in partnership with, a, with the garden club that is now there at the school. And that this year, I also was able to partner with other chemistry classes to bring them about, bring them aboard and have their students engage in the process. Because for many years, I would get like, why don't we do that? Oh, your class only does that because you teach such and such. I'm like, no, it's because I'm the teacher and that's how I, you know, Desi that's how I desire to teach science, but I can't force other people to do the same thing. And so I hated that students felt like they didn't have those same shared experiences. So this year was really beautiful to be able to collaborate with the other chemistry teachers, because even though I was the lead chemistry teacher, I did not force the YPS project on people. We had our set curriculum and then, you know, you can teach it from whatever lens you need it to, as long as you, you know, um, engaged in the primary aspects of the, the unit. And so this year, having the other chemistry teachers engage in a project also was um, pretty phenomenal. Um, and it kind of just brought everything full circle. We expanded beyond looking at soil analysis. Students tested lunchroom food and they tested local produce. Now, um, again, their reasoning for wanting to test the lunchroom food is that they were just really not satisfied with the quality of food um, that they were being served in the lunchroom. And so they're just like, it's, it has to be something in that stuff. And now me as their teacher, I actually didn't necessarily think that they were gonna find heavy metals in the lunchroom food. So allowing them to test it was just me using my space and my platform for them to explore things that were interesting and meaningful to them. I was trying to figure out a way to make sure it stayed connected to the project. So I was like, okay, well, you need help, you need nutrients and things like that. And so if you're eating these foods, you need to make sure that they're not contaminated. When they tested the lunchroom food and came back that the chicken strips had um, high levels of mercury, I was surprised just as well as they were. And so it was just a beautiful space for me to be in as an educator while I was learning not only with my students, but from my students. And so we're, you know, even going through like the legalities and trying to figure out where they come from because chicken strips with mercury didn't make any sense because mercury bioaccumulates and chickens don't eat other chickens, not that I know of. Um, I've been be vegan for a few years now, so maybe some things have changed, but from what I know, chickens don't eat other chickens. So, you know, trying to find out what my, with my students, like why those levels were so high was just phenomenal um, for me as an educator, as well as when they tested the local produce, um, finding that carrots that were already in the produce section, so carrots you would just go and pick up and bag, they tested from four local grocery stores and four, two of them had very high levels of mercury. And so, and what that led to was the students creating a video about how to wash your produce and the importance of washing your produce, because I too had become, you know, guilty of like not really washing my produce, kind of just like, you know, resting under the water. So it was just a reminder of that importance. And so for students to be able to share that information with their community was a beautiful thing to be a part of. Um, I'm a very, very big on creating hope and not despair, but I also don't want to romanticize hope. But it's important for young people to understand that these type of things, because you have to deal with, you know, legal matters and, um, you know, elected officials and things like that, it can take a while. And so I wanted them to also to be able to see hope in terms of what does it look like when there is a remediated site found or there, when there is a contaminated site found, what does it mean to be remediated? And so they built a 3D model of a remediated site, which is the historic construction of the 606, which is a walking trail, but it used to be a contaminated site. Um, I believe it was a super fun site. Um, 
And then they also presented at the YPS Symposium this year at UIC and they won or yeah, they were honored with four different um, community awards, one being the Ella Baker Award. And so as their teacher, I really felt like this year the project just came full circle. So then if we're talking about chemistry, what chemistry knowledge was needed for me to be able to engage my students in this YPS project? Specifically, in order to answer the questions, why do heavy metals persist in the soil years later? We looked at the properties of elements. They had to be able to understand metals versus non-metals. We looked at periodic trends. They had to understand metal reactivity and solubility and how they you know, decrease as you move down a periodic table, go from left to right to understand why, you know, lead is going to be in a soil even when it rains because it's insoluble. To look at specifically how are scientists able to identify unknown metals in the soil, we looked at the atomic structure, specifically making sure that young people understood what it meant for an electron to go from the ground state to the excited state and then tying that to the electromagnetic spectrum and looking at the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum so that they can understand when that electron is then dropped, then it emits a photon of energy, which we can see as visible light if it's on that part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is how devices like um, mass spectroscopies are able to determine what the unknown sample is or what the unknown metal is. We use the flame test as a macroscopic analysis so that young people could see for themselves what happens when you put metals in um, the flame and they're excited and they could see those colors that was admitted. We also use Planck's constant to mathematic for a mathematical analysis of the samples. So what happens when you have samples that are very close to each other, you know, then how are you able to determine then or identify the unknown metal salt in that case. And then for young people to be able to model how technology um, is used to analyze samples, we did a solutions lab where they had a solution of copper sulfate and they put it through the mass spectroscopy and they ran and created a concentration curve to be able to determine what the concentration of so that they can understand how that works and so how we're able to determine like 200 parts per million versus 400 parts per million and so forth and so on. And then lastly, to model the whole process for students before we went to the university, I'm sorry, before we went to Northwestern University, we did a spike soil lab where I gave them a sample of soil that was spot spiked with copper sulfate. And they went through the process of sieving the soil, digesting the um, copper, doing the analysis with the, mat, the veneer uh, mass uh, spectrometers, as well as doing a flame test and analyzing that data. So that when they went to Northwestern, even though they weren't gonna be able to do all of the components, they would understand what was happening. So they collected the, do the soil, they took the soil to North Northwestern, they did the acid digestion, but they didn't actually run the samples. The graduate students at Northwestern ran our samples for us. And so the Spike Soil Lab was like an in-class model of what was gonna be happening throughout the whole process. Uh, Dr. Mindy, we do... and then the last question that we oh, were okay. asked answering in this project was, how do we disseminate the findings to our community? And so this part is where the the pro it became an independent study. And so um, those I continue with those every other Fridays, but then we also had two week blocks where we specifically focused on our YPS project, regardless of where we were at in the, the year and regardless of the placement of other curriculum. So it became just like, this is our project that we're engaging in throughout the year and we're gonna keep coming back to it. There will be times where the units tie very tightly to it. And there'll be times where it's not necessarily a part of the content, but you know we're um, still engaging in the work. And so Dr. Mindy. this meant we had to understand hope versus despair. So we looked at EJ Victory specifically in Chicago. So we took the toxic tour and they were able to see a very large remediated site um, that is now a playground that is a capped um, contaminated site. And then they had to be able to use data to support their claims. So if you have 400 parts per million, what is that meaning in terms of the EPA regulations? And then understand remediation. And because in many cases, sometimes, 
you know, youth might think that the answer is to just remove it and, you know, do away with it, but understanding the hazards that that then brings. And so thinking about removal versus capping and things of that size, that nature, because our school at the time actually sat on a remediated uh, Superfund site. It used to be a bike factory, but it was remediated before the school was built. And then lastly, how do we use science to help our community? Like all of this information is great, but what does it mean beyond the, the classroom? So how do we have conversations with elected officials? How do we bring them into the um, space, not necessarily in appointing blame, but trying to figure out how do we move forward and how do we um, advocate or how do we improve the conditions for our community? So that's like the curricular content that we, those are the three main questions that we were seeking to address in the heavy metal um, soil project. And so before we, I open it up for questions, just some key takeaways from me engaging in this work, moving from activity to inquiry all the way to the YPS heavy metal soil project. Youth voices and experiences and, and assets are relevant. And curriculum should be flexible and adaptable. If you are at an institution where the curriculum is so rigid that you're unable to um, kind of shift to look at issues of real life environmental injustice, then we have to ask ourselves, then what is the point for young people to be engaging in that science learning if they're not able to use it to really help understand what's happening around them? And learning with students is enhances teaching and learning of science for students and teachers. I learned as much going through this process as my students did. And it was one of the most beautiful things to sit back and watch them just be great. Um, because students will show up and show out when you stand behind them and use your platform. When I mean platform, that means your classroom resources, that means your curriculum, that means your voice to be able to advocate for them, that means your connections to be able to provide opportunities for them that they might not have. So us being able to, you know, borrow materials from UIC when we didn't have uh, spectral photometers for, uh, for them to be able to go to Northwestern to test their soil samples. That's a part, all a part of my platform to create space for them to be their amazing selves. As teachers, we do not have to have all the answers. I think that's one of my main takeaways is remove the pressure for you as the teacher to be the knower of all knowledge and the authoritative figure in the space. Young people are brilliant. brilliant. They come to us with a brilliant set of knowledge and expertise that um, might just need support and applying it to the context, but students are capable of grappling with things that may not have a perfect ending or resolution. And lastly, I said this before, but I'll say it again, because it has been my number one support and able to in, in terms of being able to do this work is find people who want to teach about issues of environmental justice and social justice and work with them versus trying to convince others that it's a worthwhile endeavor. Thank you. And so I will open up the floor for questions because I know I talked a lot. <laughs> hey, thank you so thank much. You so much. We did have one question that came up in the chat. Um, it was asking about the properties and the composition of the soil. Was that important? When you say, what do you, when you say the properties of the soil? It was from Carla. Would you like to ask the question, Carla? Or are you meaning like the other elements that were in the soil, like the nutrients and things that were in the soil? All right. I think you're muted, Carla, <clears throat> if you're trying to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to type, but I'm not a very fast typist. <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I was thinking more about the composition of the clays in that in the soil that may retain some of those chemical elements in some mm -hmm. soils but not you know but different clays may not i i was mm -hmm. wondering if they examined the properties in the soil as well 
So we didn't specifically and Kim, so we talked about the composition of soil and like um, the different components and elements that are already naturally existing soil and healthy soil versus um, dead soil. But in terms of composition, specifically because majority of the project, we looked at lead and lead kind of stays surface because it's insoluble. So it's not going to travel down to, um, you know, a certain level of the soil. And so we talked about that when we talked about the importance of deciding where our um, our soil sampling sites were. And so we created a plan for how one, how how far you needed to dig in the soil to get, and then um, why it was important to stay closer to the, towards the surface, but avoid things like rocks and mulch and gravel and things like that. Now, in terms of mercury, we partnered with Kathy Nagy at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And so she would help with the testing in terms of like um, the cylinders, which were already kind of predetermined like the depth that students needed to explore um, in terms of the soil, but for lead, it was more so the importance of staying surface because lead is insoluble. So when it rains, it's not going to travel, you know, deep within the soil. Um, and then also using, um, I can't remember the name of the actual, like, technology itself, but we have these air monitors where they can also collect air data specifically around mercury. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Sonia has a question. Sonia, do you want to ask that or? We can just read it. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. It was great. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering about any networks that you're aware of, of people who teach science in the context of social justice particularly at the community college level. That's kind of where I work at. Um, mm -hmm. I know this is more K-12, but I found it few and far between, at least at that level, just connecting with people who wanna do the same type of work. Absolutely. Um, yes, I dropped it in a chat. There's an organization called SEED, Science Education for Equity, um, diversity and social justice. And so it is a group of educators primarily at the um, post-secondary level. So university and colleges who engage in science learning and teaching from a justice center, environmental justice um, perspective. And um, I'll bring it up in a second. On my PowerPoint, the very last page, there is a QR code. You can scan their QR code and it will link you to an article or book chapter that the YPS Collective wrote at one of the SEEDS conferences where we had a town hall where we were talking about like engaging in this work and finding the people. So I would definitely suggest for you to um, look at SEEDS and join that network of educators um, who want to teach you know, science from this perspective, because that's the main reason why, you know, it was created and why it exists now. Thank you so much. And and will, will the presentation be available? I can't, I don't know if that was said already, where I can scan the QR code to get, to read the paper. I think Mindy said she was going to put it back up in just a second, but also yes. we are recording and we will be putting this up on our web page as soon as we finish the recording. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah. Jen, could you put the QR code uh, on the, uh, Jen can, okay, yeah, that'd be great. When, when Jen posts it on, on the website, she can post the QR code there as well. Yeah, what I can do is go to the link from the QR code and I'll just post the link within the description of um, the talk tonight. I'll have the little dinosaur in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was another oh, question cool. from Jesse. Was it expensive to test for lead and mercury? Did you have a specific budget for this testing? So um, one, because I was a part of the YPS Collective, it was a partnership between universities and it was actually an NSF funded um, DK-12 grant. So Dr. Daniel Morales Doyle at the University of Illinois um, at Chicago, as well as Shelby Hatch from Northwestern and um, Alana Fitch 
at Loyola University and Kathy Nagy at uh, UIC. They were all a part of the NSF grant. And so with those funds, there are certain things that was you know, made available for us. Like one, my students being able to go to Northwestern to test their samples. Um, students some from other schools went to Loyola and UIC to test their samples. The instrumentation, so there was a set of veneer spectrophotometers that was purchased specifically for the YPS project. And so teachers could borrow those from UIC when we needed to use them in the, when we needed to use them in our classroom. And so that's a part of when I say find the people. So at the institutions around you, are there any scientists or science educators that are already doing this work? If it is, great. How can you partner with them to then provide opportunities for your students that you don't necessarily have in the school instead of it just being, well, we don't have those, so we don't have the money, so then I'm not going to do it. So for me, that was that partnership and that continued connection back to UIC because I graduated from UIC. And so, you know, sending an email sometimes like, hey, I want to do this lab. I don't have these resources. Do you all have anything or is there anyone you can connect me to? That's 90% of the time, how I got majority of the resources um, for my school. And then Danny would also write a letter to my principal about the YPS project and me being a part of it and what it meant. And so then my principal was very supportive in terms of, you know, finding funds available for me to be able to, you know, order the things that we need in order to be able to engage in, in the project. But for the most part, I guess you can say in terms of individual school, the most expensive thing would be finding a sub and the um, cost of the bus to go to Northwestern, which, you know, my principal was able to find money for us to do that. And we also got money from UIC because they would pay for the buses and stuff for us. Nice. Thank you. Um, but there's also right now, I'm sorry, Veneer okay. is offering a $1,000 um, grant for educators, I'll, I'll try to find the link in my email. So if you're interested, I'll drop that link. You know, this will be a great project for you to apply for that grant to get $1,000 for a veneer equipment to be able to do a project like this with, in your class with your students. Awesome. Um, Hank had a question in the chat. Would you like me to read it, Hank, or do you wanna just ask it? Read it. Okay, I will do. It says, I have always loved the idea of using science as a tool to reveal and understand the different forms of oppression. How much do you talk about or explicitly teach about environmental justice and racism in the development of your projects? So, um, April, like February, April for us is like heavy in terms of like data collection, soil analysis, preparing for the YPS project. But then after that, it's kind of like this, <sighs> you know, and so that's where we really get more into re really interrogating like the environmental justice and environmental racism. So we have discussions about what is environmental racism versus environmental justice. Um, there's a video on YouTube that I share with students. I'll find it really quick before it's over and drop it in the chat. Um, okay. But, you know, for us to, and then we kind of look at the legal aspect of it, like in all of the years of the organization through the, you know, federal government that looks at cases of environmental racism, you know, how many cases have there been classified as environmental racism? So what does that mean in terms of science? What do we need in order to be able to say that this is a case of environmental racism versus just environmental justice that happened to be endemic to this um, community? Specifically looking at the Chicago context, the Southeast side of Chicago and um, the West side are um, burdened, heavily burdened with facilities that um, constantly inundate them with different contaminants, right? And so it's, even though it's very obvious, it's been challenging to actually um, get those kind of like determined as cases of environmental racism. And so at, as a class, we kind of ex explored looking at in Chicago, there was this um, the relocation of General Iron from the north side to the southwest side. And so we engaged in conversation with it with students and, you know, the kind of allow them to grapple with what would it take? What would we need to be able to prove? Like, 
looking at people intentions, right, in order for to say that this is a case of environmental racism versus environmental justice. Um, so we explicitly get into those, what some people like to call uncomfortable conversations, but honest conversations. And I kind of, for me to keep it from being just like blame and the, you know, they don't like us because we are, you know, like black or Hispanic or Latinx, which in many cases it might be true because I'm not, I'm also not a person that tries to ignore that even though, you know, racism still exists. So I'm not going to act like it doesn't, but I also feel like that for me can be a little bit more um, challenging to help young people navigate in terms and or prove. And so I try to help them understand in what ways are is science useful for us in this conversation and what ways are science limiting for us in this conversation, right? Science can help us understand like data collection, data analysis and things like that, but it really can't help us understand people morals or um, people that values and belief systems. So then when do science become limiting and then what information do we rely on? And so how can we use what is valuable for science to be able to advocate in those instances in those situations? Um, and so like in that situation, um, the EPA ended up writing a letter to the mayor about, you know, asking them to look more and do more investigation about the company before it was relocated and things like that. And so as a class, we kind of grapple with like those decision makings, you know, processes and things like that. And I hope that has answered your questions. I'm a very open and honest and transparent student, I mean, teacher. And so I'd like to engage in the uneasiness with my students and instead of always trying to have a perfect answer for them I'm very comfortable with saying I don't know let's figure it out or let's try to go find someone who can help us and when we're at that space where we just you know don't know the way forward we understand that that's a part of science too um, sometimes prescriptive science creates this over um you know, like this over simplicity of there's always an answer and it just comes so beautiful. Like we watched the story of um, Mendeleev. And so they got to see, you know, like him sitting and it was a documentary um, put on by PBS, but sitting there for, you know, a whole weekend, literally trying to figure out the organization of the periodic table, right? It's just the way science happens that it's removed from the practice in many classrooms. And I'll speak from my context, high school classrooms, because it's like, here's the concept, here's the lab, it's perfect, it's done, boom. There's no grappling, there's no messiness. Really even, there's no errors because, um, we kind of position it where young people get the right answer. And if they don't get the right answer, you know, then it's problematic versus that's, you know, science is messy. It's kind of like this shaking up suspension yeah. where eventually over time things settle out, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I know that was tangential to your question, but yes, I explicitly address issues of environmental justice and racism in the classroom um, and try to help young people see when science is useful for us to engage in those type of conversations and when science is limiting and then when we rely on other avenues. Uh, I was just gonna say, I love how you just like accidentally called yourself a student for a second yeah, there. Yeah, I was like, yeah. Because like, yep, we all, all are learning. And that was kind of what you went in to say later was like, right? Like you're learning from your students, you're learning from them, they're learning from you. That was beautiful. Um, all right, so we have another question. We're keeping you busy here. You wanna read this one? Sure, Hank says, I notice a lot of my students have a black and white viewpoint of many issues. So trying to share authentic and meaningful issues that are gray can be challenging. I like the bringing in the law definition of science. Merging science into law can be so hard. And he admits that's actually not a question. But, and then he says it's um, not a question. Yeah, just a comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that, that you acknowledge the limitations of science. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I, and I think, you know, that's the whole point too, right? As practitioners of science, we hold science accountable. You know, we appreciate what science can do for us in terms of um, innovation, technology, and helping us understand and navigate the world in different ways. But there are also very, there are limits to science and science knowledge, but also science has in, intentionally been used to cause harm. So how do we also appreciate and critique science. But one thing I will say in terms of thinking about, you know, like students' viewpoints and being able to engage in conversations that can be challenging when, you know, there's no definitive side is, I would say, show students grace in that 
certain information has been intentionally kept from young people. And so it's important. There's one of these things that's important that's kind of like big in schools right now is foregrounding, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, accessing students' background knowledge. Well, students might not necessarily have background knowledge for certain things if they haven't been able to engage in those conversations. So sometimes it's very important for us to foreground students' background knowledge. So for specifically when we're talking about heavy metal contamination, I could have easily asked my students, oh, do you want to study the soil? You know, they probably, they might not have, some of them probably said yes, yeah, some of them might not have said yeah. But it was important for me to foreground their background knowledge and look at historically the context of heavy metal contaminations in the soil and predominantly look at maps to show where that contamination happened so that young people can come to make decisions and grapple with things on their own. And then also look at positions of power um, and also look at, look at the ways in which Black people and people of color also take on um, like white supremacist ideologies and engage in those practices, right? And how there are non-white people, non-black people that work to dismantle systems of oppression, right? And there are other people, um, indigenous people who don't necessarily fit into those other categories who also experience immense amount of oppression and exclusion related to science and science en endeavors. And so then how do we use science to help us understand those things? And how do we engage in those conversations? By foregrounding students' background knowledge, acknowledging that some information has been intentionally kept from them. So then it's not fair to say that they're unable to engage in conversation it's like having a seat at the table, but having a completely different menu than everyone else. Then what's the point of me having a seat at the table? If you're going to give me a seat at the table, then give me an informed seat at the table. And I want to have the same menu as everyone else and allow me to learn the menu and then be able to read off of it and be able to apply. Um, so I would say that in terms of like students not being able to engage in those conversations, acknowledging that schooling has intentionally kept some information from students. So it's our responsibility to not only just look at their background knowledge, but to foreground their knowledge. So um, we call it problematizing, giving them a reason to need to understand this content in order to be able to grapple and have these other type of conversations. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Mindy. Um, one question says, how long did it take to develop this project? So I've been doing the YPS project for the last five years. And so the summer before my first year, we met maybe two, three times. And then after um, like the grant funding and things like that, we met for an institute, we met for four days and during those four days, we kind of like, you know, read articles, decided what content we needed to be um, focusing on and individual teachers decided like what it would look like in their classroom. So I would say initially four days to just like do the, the planning of what it will look like and develop something that I can try in my classroom, understanding that it was perfectly imperfect. Um, to get to the point of what the project looked like this last year, I would probably say it took a solid year or year and a half of just like tweaking things, adjusting things to get it to um, what it is right now. Because I tried to partner with teachers before and, you know, um, just wasn't the case. I like to try to give people um, grace. You know, people had other priorities and I respect that. And so it became a lift for myself, like me being a transplant to, Chicago, transplant to Chicago, I didn't have as much historical knowledge about the industrialization of the neighborhood that our school was in. And so I was trying to partner with like the history teacher to kind of like help teach that with my students. And at the time, that was just not something they could take on as a priority. But it was important for our student, my students in order, in order to be able to continually um, engage in a project. So that meant that it became a transdisciplinary experience. So in chem and chemistry, I also taught about like the historical context because it was important. And so like, I would say it took like a solid year and a half to get the project to what it was this year, but that was not done in isolation. It was done in partnership with other teachers um, who wanted to teach in this way and us having different versions of similar projects at different schools. Great. I love that you said 
you know, you're working with the history teacher. I also really loved how earlier you were talking about bringing in the older students who had done the project from the year before to kind of help and um, guide the younger students. I was wondering if, do you teach multiple years in the school and could collaborate that together? Or did you have to work with that teacher and be like, okay, how can we get the older kids to come and work with the younger grade? Yeah, so yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so again, when I said this year was kind of like, you know, I can't say I had, all oh, this is recorded. I don't have any favorite years, okay? So if any of my students see this, I love all of you all the same. You are <laughs> magnificent. This year just happened to be the year where I had more overlap in terms of face-to-face -face time with students. But prior to this year, I taught them um, chemistry, which happened in their sophomore year. And then I didn't have them in classes anymore um, for the duration of their time in school. And so just so happened because we had department so the sci all of the science classes were in a particular hallway the physics classroom was directly across the hall from me and me and the physics uh, perfect teacher had a really great relationship in that I would always ask about what's happening in their classroom and they would always ask about what's happening in my classroom and so students when on their way to physics, they would come back and just like, hi, Michelle, what happened with the YPS project? What's the soil data? Like, this, especially the students who didn't get to analyze their data, what was the numbers? What are y'all gonna do this year? And so just that natural curiosity for students, when they would pop in, I was just like, okay, let me figure out a way to keep them involved. And so juniors had fifth period lunch, which was, I typically had a class during fifth period because I taught 10th graders who had fourth period lunch. And so, it what they were able in their schedule to be able to come in the classroom and kind of engage with us. And so that kind of happened kind of like serendipitously. Um, and seniors had six period lunch. And so they were able to come in my six period class. This year though, I had, I also taught AP seminar and AP research. And the students who were in chemistry with me when um, we had to go virtual, so they weren't able to analyze their samples. I had them for AP seminar, and a part of AP seminar requires them to, um, you know, like do this team multimedia presentation where they analyze something that's happening, and they chose to continue looking at the heavy metal soil project. And then I had that same group of students as seniors, and they had to do an independent study project, and two students in that group chose to look at um, heavy metal contamination and issues of environmental racism. And at the same time, I was also teaching a group of chemistry students. And so they were able to just like engage with them and continually share that knowledge and information. And so one of my AP research students wrote a paper about the whole like YPS project because she engaged in it as a sophomore. And so as a as a senior, even though she wasn't able to analyze that data as a sophomore, she was able to analyze that data and actually in, um, develop a um, research project around it that we're trying to submit for publication. So this year just came really full circle for me. Awesome. That's great. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, I've not seen anything else in the chat and we're at about an hour since you started talking. So I don't wanna take up too much more time of yours, but it was really special to have you. Um, yeah, yeah, so glad. We, we did have a request for the uh, the PowerPoint itself. Would, would that be possible to get, get a copy of that? Sorry, I was trying move the thing on my screen. Yes, I can share. I'll just remove the pictures from the PowerPoint because some of them are, um, you know, yeah. of my students, things like that. So that's yeah. it. Yeah, and again, you can you can send that to me and then we'll get it posted on the, if, if that's okay, we can get it posted on the website. Mm -hmm. We have lots of thank yous in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time, your presence and your energy. I appreciate the space to be able to share. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any further questions or if you need you know, someone who wants, if you need a partner, someone who you know wants to teach science from this perspective and you might need a sounding board, um, feel free to reach out. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Have a wonderful night.
Thanks, Thanks everybody y'all. for joining us tonight. Thanks. We're going to Thank stop you, recording name. and uh, can hang out for a little bit if anybody wants to talk name stuff. And if folks who don't want to talk name stuff can, <laughs> can head out. All right. Thank stop. you for coming. Thank you all. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Good to see you. Many oh. thanks. Oh, yeah.